Okay, thank you everybody for joining today for the last official action period call of the uh, this current wave of the injury prevention plus seek uh, wave four of this. I appreciate all of you uh, joining today as far as participants and our presenters. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iden. Uh, you know protocol for uh, introductions in the chat. Um, I also have um, a question to ask you guys in the chat. I'm going to put that in also. Uh, we have uh, kind of a lot going on, so we will um, uh, get started. Uh, but as far as the welcome, if you could also incorporate uh, who you are, where you're from, and then how we could help you uh, support you during this time um, at the, the last couple months of the SEEK program. Uh, we just want to ensure that you guys uh, are supported. Hopefully you, you know that you are you feel supported during this time. Um, we want to ensure the valuable outcomes and make sure that uh, MOC is not a problem come the end. And thank you as always for uh, ODH and their partnership with this program, including the Violence and Injury Prevention section or VIPS. And again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, jumping on the attendance. If you uh, don't mind sharing your thoughts with the question in the chat. Um, and we will get right to um, Zainab's data summary. And Zainab, I will stop sharing if you don't mind sharing your slides. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm working off two screens too. So just let me know. Uh, I don't know how to share my screen on Zoom. Oh, here it is. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Let me give you permissions. How about now? Okay. Um, and I'm gonna slide share this. But you can see the other one, right? Yeah, I can see the big one and then the small one coming up. How do I switch the screen? Uh, display settings, maybe? Okay, better? Yes. Okay, um, so hi everyone. I have the um, data slides prepared for today. Um, so they, these data slides will show aggregate data. Um, so for all the practices combined, um, I kind of created the same chart that Brooke had sent to you earlier this week or possibly last week. Um, so the charts that you will see now probably look similar to what you have, um, but the data within the charts will contain data from all the practices that are participating in the project. Um, and so I divided each of the topic areas into a slide on its own. Um, so the first slide here, we have social need, um, and really what I have plotted here is the rate of the discussion. Um, so if the family indicates that um, that they have they're having an issue with something in, in terms of social needs, um, you know if they have it, um, if they're asking for help finding a job or if they're asking for help finding their care, their daycare for their child, um, that would be within the social needs. Um, and if they said that yes, they do need need help with that, then that's um, an opportunity for you to discuss that with them. Um, and so here before this uh, line, you can see this is the baseline data that all of you shared with us. Um, and you can see starting in September when the majority of the practices started collecting their quality improvement data, um, we did see a significant increase here to 100% of families discussing their social needs or practices discussing, discussing social needs for families. Um, and that was in September. In October, we did see a slight decrease. In October, all of the practices that are participating in the project started collecting data. Um, in September, there were a few that had a late start. Um, so October is their first month. Um, and so again, here you can see that there's been a significant increase um, since baseline or since the data that was collected in baseline. Um, here, the orange line represents the older age group, so the 13 months to five years. Um, and the blue line represents the younger age group, which is birth to 12 months. Um, and again, anyone can stop me at any time if they have questions or you can wait till I'm done and you can ask questions or you can put them in the chat. Um, and so here in our next slide, we have our family needs. Um, and so family needs also, you know, um, and Brooke, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, family needs include questions about, you know, how the mom feels, um, if the mom is, stuff, you know, is suffering from some anxiety or if she feels like she um 
you know, there's questions that ask about if the mom, the mom is feeling depressed or if the mom is feeling anxious. Um, and those are those questions are within the family needs topic. Um, and again, here we have the block line that separates baseline months from QI month, months or quality improvement months. And again, here we can see a significant increase in um, the rate of discussion. So once the family says that they are having an issue with any of the questions that are within the topic and the physician or um, the caretaker or the, um, the primary care physician is discussing those with them, then um, those families will be included in this data. And again here, the orange line represents the older age group, 13 months to five years, and then the blue line is the younger one. Um, Car seat safety, um, ever since the beginning of the project and even within baseline um, data, it looks like most of the practices were already talking about this topic with families, um, whether it was you know, giving them resources or whether it was telling them um, how to properly install a car seat or you know, allowing them um, or giving them the information that you know, nurses and um, first responders usually um, know how to install a car seat properly. Um, so again, after speaking with most of the practices in the beginning of the project, it looks like you know this was a topic that was readily discussed um, in the practice, but we are still seeing an increase um, throughout QI um, in both age groups. Um, home safety, uh, it looks like a lot of the a lot of the practices were discussing it. And again, um, just let's backtrack a little. Um, these comparisons are very similar. However, the data is collected differently. Um, so we aren't necessarily comparing the red apples to red apples. We can say that we're comparing red and green apples. So um, before, you know, when we were collecting baseline data, we did ask, um, you know, we asked about all these different uh, topics and we included what could potentially be within each topic. And we asked you whether or not you discussed that or addressed that, that issue, um, whether you provided resources or whether there was no discussion at all. Um, and it looks like a lot of the practices said that they discussed um, home safety. However, there have been some additional questions that we added in QI that include whether or not the family wants the number for poison control, um, whether or not the, um, the parents have secured um, tip, like furniture to the wall that could potentially tip over, um, whether or not they have um, you know, gates near stairs. Um, and so, oh, and whether or not the family or the, uh, the primary caregiver for the child has had CPR training within the past three months. Um, and so it looks like a lot of the families have said no, that they don't have that training, or they said that no, they're not, they haven't secured their furniture to the wall, or they said yes, that they want the number for poison control. Um, those three questions, usually we've seen that the practices have not really discussed that with the family. And our assumption is that, you know, that that information is in the resource sheet that, um, that you could provide to the families. And so technically, um, to you, it might seem like you're not discussing that. Um, and that was in September. And I think after we spoke with a couple of practices and we let them know, hey, um, you don't necessarily have to have a, a like a verbal discussion with them. If you just give them the information through um, the resource sheet, then that technically could be considered as having a discussion. And we did see an increase from October um, compared with September. Um, but again, we, you know, it's a little less than what we saw at baseline, but again, after my explanation, I think that you can rest assured that, you know, that's why you, you can see a little bit of that, but we hope to um, increase that to 100% after, you know, everyone knows that you can claim that you had a discussion with the family if the information that you wanted to provide to them is in the resource sheet. Um, and then finally, we have the safe sleep. We didn't ask safe sleep questions for the older age group, um, the 13 to 13 months to five years. Um, but again, we are seeing 100% um, discussion rate in, in October um, compared with about 80%, 81% in September. Um, so we hope to keep it at 80, 100% um, moving throughout the months of QI. Um, but really, we're hoping, you know, you know we, we just want you to do the best that you can. So. Um, very good job with everyone. Um, you can see that a lot of the practices, um, again, this data has combined, um, the combined data from everybody that's participating in the project. And you can see that the majority are doing very well. Um, and so here's our last slide, resources provided. We really, um, you, know, you know, the AEP and everyone on the team really spent a lot of time 
you know, putting all kinds of information on that resource sheet so that the family that, you know, really indicates that they need um, a discussion with anything has a lot of resources on that resource sheet that we provided. And so we're really hoping that as many families get those resource sheets so that um, even if they were too shy or um, didn't feel like they wanted to have a discussion with the physician about specific things, they still have that resource sheet where they can go in their own privacy or in the privacy of their home and look at the, the resources that we provide, whether it's you know trying to find a job, whether it's um, trying to find a food bank if they're worried about their food running out, um, if they need some um, numbers or the poison control number or a number for someone, uh, or you know just information on you know installing car seats properly. So um, we we have seen an increase in uh, the younger age group birth to twelve months, um, and we are seeing pretty consistent, um, very high ninety percent um, in the older age group. Um, we hope to get these to one hundred uh, potentially, but um, again. As long as we're seeing an increase, I think that everyone's doing pretty well. Um, and that's the end of my uh, slides for today. So if anyone has any questions or um, if anyone has any questions about the data slides that were sent to you and you would like to discuss, you know, please let Brooke know and we can set up a meeting um, for us to talk about your data. Um, or if you have any other questions, then we could also help with that. Um, but Brooke, that's what I have prepared for today. Um, it doesn't look like that. there's anything in the chat that I can see or any questions about these slides. So um, Dr. Denny has her hand <laughs> raised. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to jump in and just say awesome job, you guys. Um, I know how, frankly, very difficult primary care is right now um, between influenza, RSV. We're seeing a major increase in COVID again locally. Uh, my clinic is in the middle of this measles outbreak. Um, I know this is super hard, and so I just really appreciate the continued data collection and reporting. And, um, you know, even though we are seeing all these infectious disease injury and social determinants are so important still. And so just I, appreciating that you guys are acknowledging that and continuing to do this work, even though um, work is hard right now, for sure. Thank you, Dr. Denny, for those words. Uh, Zainab, thank you so much. I don't see any questions. Um, I want to give uh, everyone an opportunity uh, one more time to ask questions on data. We can always do that offline at a meeting, no problem at all there. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Back to my slides, I hope. Zainab, thank you. Um, I am also, because we need more going on in this meeting, going to move some windows around and launch a poll. Maybe. Okay. Uh, so um, as Dr. Denny um, alluded to, uh, things are very hard right now. Uh, there is a seasonal illness impact on your practices, uh, which is translating into maybe an impact on how much time you have to dedicate to this program. So um, if you don't mind answering these poll questions, uh, the data will be used internally for our team. So if you could answer honestly, that would be great. Um, and if Dr. Denny, if you have anything to add to your previous comments, um, that would be great. Or Dr. Gittleman, if you have any uh, words of encouragement for our participants while they answer the poll. Sorry, Brooke, I didn't realize that I had my own <laughs> slide <laughs> section. No, right. it was perfectly timed, no problem. <laughs> okay, I'm good, Mike. Maybe he's not on yet, um, but. Uh, I don't want to speak for him, but he would say, again, that you guys are doing a wonderful job, and we appreciate your continued efforts uh, for this program. Um, we will be collecting data because of everything going on this wave uh, into January, and we are, are here just because the action period calls are ending um, doesn't mean that the support and the, that the program is ending. We are going to continue. Uh, we are here for you, um, and um, you know this, and uh, we will uh, continue to uh, send out good information and be available for meetings or anything that you would need around support for this program. Okay. Mike, are you on? Okay. 
Uh, we will uh, start with our presentations um, uh, around home safety today. Don Gardner uh, from Cincinnati Children's has been kind enough to uh, uh, join the call today to present on home safety. And Don, I have your slides. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So just first of all, thanks so much for having me today, just for giving me some time to talk about one of my favorite intervention topics, which is definitely home safety, something I've been um, doing for a long time and, and again, just enjoy. Um, and I'm going to share today what we're doing locally and what we are doing locally. Um, just keep in mind that it can be adapted to the populations you serve, whether it's on a larger scale, a smaller scale, or even just in bits and pieces. Um, you know, we have an injury prevention team, so we're able to um, do some extended outreach. And I know that some areas may not be able to do that, but there are bits and pieces of this that uh, could be uh, replicated uh, with your populations. Um, so I do want to start off though, um, I just think it's important to touch base on how we got to the structure we use today. And I always um, like to acknowledge our community partners um, because without them, our outreach would just not be as effective. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about kind of um, how we got to where we are today. Next slide. So we rely heavily on injury data to lead us to who we should be engaging and the injury mechanism focus. Um, we also use the data to help kind of begin the framework for outreach. But as you'll see, we understand that data may not lead us to the best possible framework. And so um, we use it to kind of start it, but we use our community partners to help us build what's best for the population. Next slide. So we looked at Hamilton County specific data and we we kind of began to build our outreach. This was um, our outreach structure. This was in 2010. And we were looking at where children in Hamilton County were being injured and how they were being injured using the Hamilton County surveillance system and the US Census. Next slide. So county specific data led us to focusing on home injuries to children less than five when we looked at injury rates, injury location, and then cost of injury. Next slide. And then we looked at research um, on best practices to outreach, and we followed outcomes from a study that came actually out of CCHMC um, called a random, randomized control trial of home injury hazard reduction, the home injury study. And that study kind of gave us a framework to best practices um, with data supporting, supporting injury reduction. So after after looking at that study, we realized that we needed to look at um, including face-to-face -face education, the provision of safety, equipment, and then uh, delivery to the home if we wanted best practices to reducing injury. Next slide. That's fine. So after reviewing the data, we moved to engage our data identified community, and that community was Norwood, Ohio. Um, when we looked at the injury rates for Norwood, um, we realized that the monthly injury rates to children living in the city of Norwood were larger than the monthly county based uh, uh, county based rates for injury. Um, so Norwood is a small community within Hamilton County. It's its own city with its own um, fire department, uh, you know, own uh, uh, government, and so. Um, when we pulled up our, our specific data, we saw that uh, we had a lot of kids in Norwood and that those kids were being injured in the home. Next slide. Um, we also use this to look at potential partnerships. So we knew that, they, again, they had their own health department, fire department, police department, they had schools, and then they had organizations working within um, within the Norwood area. So some of those organizations only worked in Norwood, but then there were others who worked in other areas um, of Hamilton County, but then also focused in Norwood. And so we wanted to um, make sure that we had partnerships there um, so that we could get some buy-in and, um, and start to build um, a program. And this took about a year um, to build. And what we learned is that um, it does take time. Oh, we're moving right there. Okay, what we learned is that um, it did take time to just kind of listen. And some of that time was non-traditional time. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we were incorporating their needs so that it was a shared vision and not a hospital um, initiative. Um, we learned that interest is not equal commitment. So there were people around the table who were interested, but just declined to actually really, really get involved. Um, commitment does not equal investment. So um, although they were uh, committed and you know said that they would be there, they really just didn't want to invest the time to really make it work. And that was fine. You know, This is why we were in those beginning stages of finding out who should be around the table. And again, that took almost a year to do before we were able to kind of um, 
build our team. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we go back a slide to the? Oh, no, that's it. Okay. So, um, Again, after almost a year of listening, creating awareness, data sharing, trust building, um, that member shifting, kind of disappearing, uh, we had some bumps and bruises and then some total failures. We were able to finally create a um, injury prevention program that that sh shared hospital and community interest and, and hospital and community um, partnership. So we called it PEN, Preventing Injuries in Norwood. Um, the member of Penn were the members of the Penn group were called Penn Heads. And um, again, this represented a partnership that not just a hospital initiative. And it was we used Penn and those partners around the table to help us identify successful avenues to injury prevention outreach and how to implement that outreach. Um, we also used them to identify um, best practices for their families and their community. And we used them to lead um, family recruitment and volunteer support. Um, so the key partners were the schools. We we had the city council, the police department, and then some of the community organizations. And then at this time, um, we were when we were looking at funders, we had State Farm, which was has a a um, site in Norwood that was interested in, in helping a partner. Uh, we had Messer, who was a construction company that actually is here at the hospital that was interested in safety initiatives and wanted to provide support. And then at that point in time, we had Coles Cares for Kids as funding. Next slide. So we, we worked to create a safety bundle and that bundle was compromised of proven equipment uh, used to reduce the rate of the top home injuries that we were seeing in our emergency rooms. So those were falls, burns and poisonings. Um, again, we used the funding that we had from Coles, uh, the local state farm funding uh, that was based in Norwood and then we had Messer Construction. And then we worked with the group to figure out how we should disseminate it. So we knew best practices told us that um, again, we needed to have some face-to-face, -face. we needed to, uh, provide the equipment and we needed to be, get into the homes. Next. So we created some safety um, education and um, an educational script. We already had identified our bundle and we provided some installation training because that was something that the um, community told us that they needed. They said they did not have the tools to install some of the safety equipment that we were um, we would be providing. And so that equipment would just sit. And so they asked if there was a, a provision to where we could actually provide installation. And so we were able to purchase drills. We were able to, um, again, engage those community partners and train them on how to not only provide the education with the script, but also how to um, use the tools to install the, that equipment. And so at that time, the equipment was the cabinet and drawer latches. Um, we had to install a safety gate, which is a pressure mounted gate. So we didn't need any tools, but um, families needed help with that. And then also our smoke and carbon monoxide detector, which we wanted mounted on the wall. Next slide. Uh, we created a waiver, and a lot of this waiver really stressed the importance of supervision being the best way to reduce the rate of home injuries. And one thing that I um, really liked about this waiver is that we're able to update it. So, um, you know, in the beginning, we had questions that just ask basic injury prevention. Um, so we asked, have you ever had home safety education for your child? If yes, who provided that education? education, um, because we want to know if there are other partners out there doing the same thing so that we can then uh, work with those partners. Um, we've switched it up from uh, one of the questions up from uh, uh, questions about like maybe window locks to now we're addressing um, uh, smoke and carbon monoxide detector. And we're also our newest question is addressing um, safe gun storage. And so we ask now on the survey or, or on the waiver, are your guns stored safely in your home? And the answers are, I don't own a gun. I own a gun and I do not have safe storage. I own a gun and it is safely stored. Um, and so I, first of all, I would really like to thank the a, um, AAP for their safe firearm storage education. That's what we use when um, we have a family that is seeking more information on safe storage. And um, one of the good things about this is the questions that we ask, if they need the resource, we have the resource. So although um, guns box, gun lock boxes are not in our standard bundle, if we ask these questions and a family identifies that they do need safe storage, we will go ahead and provide them with a, a gun lock box, which is a plus. Next one. So we started out with this being one-on-one -on -one education. So we had um, agencies that were going into the homes of their clients and they were providing the home safety education, the home safety bundle, the installation. Um, we also, as our team, were, were going in and um, 
when families would self-identify that they needed a bundle, our team would go in, provide the education, provide the installation. And then we had the our some of our funders reach out and say, hey, we want our employees to participate in, um, in this outreach and to participate in giving back to the community and to safety. So we um, created what we called a home safety day. Um, it was a volunteer opportunity that we did on a Saturday. And it provided us a chance to engage multiple families with our home safety intervention in one day in a very short period of time. Again, using community and sponsorship volunteers um, it was organized by the Penn team, and um, what we did was we found a neutral location. We had volunteers show up there. We trained those volunteers half on being educators, um, home safety educators, the other half on being home safety um, installers. Um, so we had cabinets there. We had the drills. We taught them how to, to install the cabinet and drawer latches, um, the smart smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. After their training, we partnered them up, one educator, one um, installator and installer and then we sent them to homes that had pre-registered for that Saturday and those they went out within a four hour period and they did um it was normally between three to four homes a piece so we had some that moved pretty fast and so they were able to get in more um but our very first safety day we had 74 families signed up and we were able to engage 72 of those families within four hours. Um, so it was just, it was a great win, not only for the uh, community of Norwood and their families being safe, but also um, for the hospital as we're tracking an injury reduction. Um, that event, Home Safety Day, turned into two to three events annually. Um, you know, we looked at the community calendar every year, we put a safety day on that and we secured that, again, that location, um, and volunteers knew and they looked forward into our safety days. Next slide. And this is just some of the volunteer feedback, um, you know, just making a difference in homes that they visited, helping kids stay safe, seeing little faces, knowing that there was a, a little bit safer after their efforts and feeling like I helped someone in need um, and calling their opportunity rewarding. Next slide. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about outreach results. Next slide. Um, so we we looked at data. We started our, our home safety outreach in 2012. We looked at data in 2015. And what we found is that results, um, there was a decrease in injuries of, of up to 59% in the homes that received our safety bundle and an up to 12% increase in homes with no bundle. And so we wanted to do cost savings. So um, at that point, we looked at um, what, you know, what that reduction of injury looked like as far as costs. We kept monthly running charge, uh, moving uh, charge, just so we could see where we were going, see if there were any trends, and and hopefully try to um, head off those trends or uh, be able to identify them so that we could make adjustments to the outreach if that's what we needed to do. So we did track our um, trends uh, also monthly. Um, our goal was to get to a 30% reduction in three years. Um, so that was another reason why we were tracking, but we really wanted to look at just those monthly trends to see when we were going up and 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 why um, so that we can make our make changes. Next slide. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the spread and the impact, next slide. We started out in Norwood. Um, we were in Norwood for a couple of years when we um, again continued to look at our trauma registry data and we saw that the Norwood injury rates were kind of dropping but we had other injury rates that were um, that were starting to um, cause concern. And so we were able to expand into additional zip codes. Um, one of the great things is that we had already established a program and partnerships with agencies who, again, were not only working in Norwood, but were working in other areas. So they knew about the program. So we didn't need as much time to be able to get it up and running in some of the other zip codes. Um, so just by using word of mouth recruitment, social media, community partners, um, it created less time and we were able to kind of push this program out into um, our new targeted areas. Next slide. In 2019, we looked at the injury rates um, in our intervention homes versus our non-intervention communities. Again, just to make sure that what we're doing is working and, um, and if we needed to make any changes, we would, um, we would look at that. Next slide. So these are injury rates amongst all our um, partners. And we know, and one of the things why I'm so um, uh, so just wanted to want to stress how important community is and their input is. Um, if you look at um, 
Evanston, the, the green line that was going down and then it kind of shot up, we lost a major community partner. And so we lost contact with a lot of the families. And as you can see, um, injury rates began to rise, rise because of it. So I, again, I am always stressing the importance of just some of community input so that a community um, has that value and, fi and finds buy-in. Next slide. Um, so when we're talking about sustainability, you can go to the next slide. Um, we have now had some of the, the organizations or some of the communities that have kind of adopted this. So in Norwood, our team no longer goes in there. If there's a family that needs uh, home safety education, um, the Norwood Fire Department has now taken that on. They get in their fire trucks, they go to the home, they do the home safety um, education and installation. Um, we partner with community block by block groups. Um, we do some testing to identify families in our um, local uh, pediatric uh, PCP clinics. Um, we utilize nursing programs, community health, um, it, you know, any group that also targets the same age group that we um, look, so kids look for kids under five, we reach out to them to see if this is um, an additional um, resource that they would like to share with their families. And then we have now been able to secure um, hospital and some state funding so that we continue to reach those high risk underserved families um, in Ohio. Um, we did have to make some changes to the outreach uh, post-COVID, and so um, those changes have actually been really good. Um, we had to adjust some of the equipment, um, so we had to move from equipment that needed to be installed to equipment that did not need to be installed because we were not going into the homes. So like the push down lock cabinet, uh, push down um, cabinet locks, we moved to sliding cabinet locks. Um, so we did the education virtually um, to, you know, talk to the families then. And then we would just drop off the bundles with these now uh, modified equipment on their porch. And then they were able to um, try to install that equipment if they needed help. We would set up another Zoom call and we would walk through it. Um, we also modified like the smoke and carbon monoxide detector. So we were no longer having them install it on the wall if they could not do that because they didn't have a drill um, or a stud finder. We were then having them just take it out, put it in the bracket and put it in a put her on a dresser or a shelf in the sleeping area so that it was working. Um, and, you know, so uh, again, the, the, the equipment was being utilized. Um, Pre-COVID, we reached about 450 homes a year. Um, Post-COVID, we're now um, reaching close to 300 homes a year. We are still using the um, virtual resource um, because there are some families we know that will never open their door. So we're still using the virtual resource. Um, and we haven't had any safety days um, since post-COVID. So those have kind of dropped our numbers also. Um, but, you know, it's th th those that COVID has been has been really helpful in some ways as far as just make, helping us to reach other families and um, making the program a little um, easier. Um, so the keys to success when we let the, the um, community lead, um, one thing we found important is that we didn't ask questions we couldn't provide answers to. So if we asked if you had a working smoke detector in the home and you said no, we were able to provide you with a working smoke and CO detector. Um, we didn't provide furniture straps, but we could provide education and then no to low cost alternatives such as pushing the TV back on the shelf or talking to parents about their behavior. So, you know, if you don't want your child climbing up the dresser, don't leave the sippy cup on top of the dresser where as soon as you leave the room, they're going to climb. We're absolutely open to modifications um, and we do re look at the bundles every couple years and, um, and make adjustments to that. And then we also want to make sure that the resources that we have reflect what the community needs and what, the, and what we can provide. So thanks for allowing me just to share. I'm happy to take any questions. Don, thank you so much for the good information. Um, while uh, our participants think of good questions for you, um, are there any uh, future corporate um, partnerships, uh, maybe IKEA for furniture safety or any expansion in the state of note? Um, so, and we are looking, we're definitely, we are looking at IKEA. Um, we are, we, just to at least to be able to buy the the furniture straps. I know that at one point that was um, a really big push for them. So um, there are some some talks. Unfortunately, um, um, we'll get kind of push it. I'll get included in those talks after the fact. But <laughs> there are, um, from what I understand, there are there are some talks in the works. Good. 
uh, you had an awesome program, Don, comment, but no questions yet. Um, I am able to um, give Don any questions that you think of, or uh, she, her contact information is right here. Uh, Dr. Denny, I really appreciate the point you made beginning regarding uh, community partnerships. They take a lot of time and listening. Uh, there may be some bumps in the road, but the investment really pays off and the dividends. And we know you work hard to establish those because uh, the data showed what a partnership can do. Absolutely. John, thank you so much. No, thank you. Okay, we will uh, move along to our next presentation uh, around child passenger safety. We have Anne and Heidi on the line. I have your slides. Perfect. I'm Ann Roeder at Columbus Public Health, and I'll let Heidi introduce herself, and then she's going to start it out. So we're going to tag team this. And my name is Heidi Dolan. I'm the coordinator here for child passenger safety at UH Rainbow Babies and Children um, in Cleveland, Ohio. Next. 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 <laughs> yep. <laughs> you can skip a few in there. Great. So why is CPS so important? Um, motor vehicle crashes still are um, one of the, the leading three causes of death and injury to children in the United States. Um, the needle moves occasionally. Um, it tends to stay in the top three. But just some quick statistics. Um, an adult is injured in a car crash every 10 seconds. So six people are injured in a crash every minute, um, which is just astounding to me. And then a fatality occurs every 12 minutes. So five, will, five fatalities will occur in the United States during this presentation. Um, children are still being injured in crashes every day. Um, I know here at Rainbow, Motor vehicle crashes are our second leading cause of injury. Um, and we do a lot of outreach in the area to try and get those um, injuries down. Next slide. So we know seatbelts work. We also know car seats work, but they have to be used correctly every time. Um, the problem with you know, seatbelts is that they don't fit an adult or our, our child properly. They need to be in a car seat or a booster seat. Um, the use of seatbelts and airbags have reduced the risk of death and injury um, over many years. And we also know that a properly installed car seat works. I know the misuse rate up here in my the 10 counties I cover ranges between 85 and 93%. Um, so that's typically three out of four car seats are used incorrectly. So um, it's really important to educate parents on proper use. Next. So um, our OBB program, Ohio Buckles Buckeye, um, it's in all 88 counties. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see the, well, let me talk about the OBB and court program first. So it is geared towards our low income population. We don't turn anybody away. They need a car seat. Um, we want to increase the avail availability of people getting car seats um, that maybe they can't afford it. So that's our whole goal. So all 88 counties have them. They get the funding from police officers, highway patrolmen, um, sheriff's office when they give out citations for not having a car seat, not being properly restrained. We do follow the WIC guidelines. So we ask that um, they're following WIC. If they haven't applied for WIC, we ask that they you know, apply for WIC. You can go to the next one. And then these are our people in our regional coordinators. Dayton does have a new one. I did send that to Brooke. So if you're interested in the Dayton one, she can send that to you. But you can find this on the ODH website. So there's all of our contacts. Next one. Next one. So there's a big difference in so our age versus state. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Ann. Um, so the Ohio law states that a child must be restrained in a child safety seat until the ages of until four years of age and 40 pounds, and then a booster seat at 40 pounds. Um, up to four feet nine or eight inch or eight, eight years of age, excuse me. Um, our law is okay. It's not one of the best ones around. Um, it really doesn't protect children adequately or um, protect them long enough. So most of our presentation will focus on best practice versus state law, but we'll, we'll talk about both. So next. 
the basics of car seats are um, stages. So we want kiddos in rear facing seats until at least two years old. We know that they're safest rear facing, but we'd love to see them max out the height and weight limits of that car seat if they can stay rear facing longer. A forward facing seat with a harness till at least four years of age, but we'd love, again, love to see them max out that harness longer. Booster seats, they have to be both four years of age and 40 pounds. And that's not only by state law, but that's by most manufacturers' recommendations. And then booster seats till about four feet nine. Um, seat belts are designed for four feet nine or taller, and we always want the front seat reserved for um, 13 plus years. Um, and we really stress to parents and caregivers that every child is different. Um, and really look at those stages of car seat and look at that developmental of that child before you move them to the next seat. Okay, so rear facing only. Um, we want to, every car seat can be different. They can start at, like Heidi said, start at four pounds or start at birth. Um, most of them do start at the four pounds now. And some of them will go up to 35 pounds for the rear facing for that infant carrier. Some are only still 22 pounds. So they may look the same. And parents might be like, well, my friend, you know, still has their 25 pound in the infant carrier, but their seat may only go to 22 pounds. So we really need to read those labels. Um, we want to use it to the maximum that we can. Um, height, look at the height too. Some children are taller, obviously, um, but we want to use to the maximum whether they reach the height or the weight first. I usually tell parents, if they can't carry it anymore, you know, you can still use it in your vehicle. Just because you can't carry that carrier, carrier anymore, if the baby still fits in it, can still use that. Next slide. So rear facing only for the infants. We wanna make sure that parents don't feed babies in their car seats. When they're at home, they should not be sitting in that car seat. Remind parents of that. Um, the, if they're at home and the baby's asleep, take them out of the car seat, put them in a safe sleep environment. Don't let them sleep in that car seat. Okay. Uh, here at, well, all the OBB sites, we just do the convertible car seats. So that's kind of one reason that we stress the convertible car seats also is that it gets the child moving more. So we'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, so car seat co tolerance tests, they do do that um, if it's for a small baby. Okay. If you're traveling, we try and remind our parents to take the baby out of the car seat, you know, every two to three hours, actually physically take them out of the car seat so they can move around a little bit. Okay. We don't want to add any extra things to any car seats, whether it be the harness pad, um, a little head protector around them. Okay. Uh, we usually tell parents, don't add anything. It has not been crash tested with the car seat. Next slide. So car beds are out there, just so people know, and you doctors probably know. Good, Heidi. Go ahead. Okay, so um, you can get them at the hospital. I don't think hospital use them very much, but they are out there for if the baby has a breathing problem or something. Next slide. So it may be for if they can't tolerate that semi-recline position or any medical needs. Um, the rear facing does provide the better protection and use only the car beds when medically necessary. I think it, the car bed numbers have really declined in the past years. We really try and get them into a conventional car seat. Next I'll slide. I'll jump in to say we run, oh, Heidi wants we to run add. a... Um, we run a um, car seat loaner program here at Rainbow and we've really reduced the number of car beds that go out. I think in the past year, we've probably loaned two out um, and they were for very specific reasons. We really work with our nurses on positioning and getting that child in that, con that conventional seat. They're so much safer in that conventional seat. Um, it has a lot more positioning um, needs and a lot of positioning um, you know, features in a conventional seat than in a car bed. Um, the ankle tolerance testing is done on any child who was born 37 weeks or earlier. Um, so we really have worked with our nurses to reduce the amount of car beds that go out um, in our loaner program. So keep that in mind. 
Thanks, Heidi. She works in the hospital, so she works more with that. So these are some examples of some angle um, indicators on car seats. And it's real important, especially with newborn, they don't have the head control that the angle is correct. And that's one reason why the infant carrier, we want to make sure that parents are not letting the child sleep in that infant carrier when it's not in the car. So you want to make sure that angle is correct. Next slide. So rear facing only, we have these um, harness uh, little checkpoints here. Um, the harness use, we want to make sure the harness for any car seat that you're not able to pinch any of the harness. Okay, so pinching up at the collarbone is where you should not be able to pinch it. That chest clip right there, that should always be at armpit level. Okay, and again, you don't want to add anything to the seat that was not crash tested with it. Okay. Convertible car seats are just that. It converts from rear facing to forward facing. And I think it's important to note in the OBB program, we use convertible car seats. We do not issue infant seats. Um, infant seats have a really short shelf life where a convertible car seat will last a child longer. So the ones we use here in Ohio go from five pounds to 65 pounds. So really can be used from you know birth until anywhere between four and six years of age based on how the child grows. So keep that in mind as well. Convertible car seat has two different belt paths because it goes rear facing to forward. Next. We do encourage rear facing as long as possible in that convertible car seat. So those sure rides that we use, they can rear face up to 40 pounds. So great for a kiddo who may be small for their age or maybe has some developmental issues. Um, we like to keep them rear facing. Um, we like them to outgrow that rear facing room of that car seat. That's the new recommendation from the AAP is that a child outgrows the recommendations for any of the limits on a car seat. Next. And then a combination seat, um, it only goes forward facing, so it converts to a booster. Still has a five point harness, so it's a great option if you're going from, you know, a rear facing only seat maybe to a combination sometimes. Um, it's a great option. Sometimes it has a higher um, harness level for the child so they can grow with it. Next. So when a child goes forward facing, we know that they're safer rear facing. Um, the way the car seat is designed, rear facing takes all that impact from a crash, takes that crash energy off of a child's body, keeps their head nice and flat against the back of the seat. So when they go forward facing, the only thing that's not really restrained anymore is their head. So what we look at is we want to reduce that head excursion, um, which they've added the addition of the tether anchor. So that goes from the top of the seat to the back of your vehicle seat, or might be in your back window, could be on the um, on the ceiling. There's lots of different places for it. But what that does is helps reduce that head excursion, and at times it can reduce it between two to three inches, which is a lot for a child's spine in a crash. Next. Again, we want to make sure the car seat strips are tight, unable to pinch the slack of the shoulders. We call it the pinch test. If you can pinch the fabric of the shoulders, it's too loose. Um, and we really work with parents because I would say nine out of 10 car seats that come in, the straps are, or the test clip is at, um, on the stomach. We want it at armpit level. It's a pre-crash positioner, so it actually has an important feature during a crash. It keeps those shoulder straps on the child's shoulders so that when um, those crash forces are being spread, it keeps them firmly seated in that seat, and then making sure those straps are not twisted. If the straps are twisted, it's really hard to get a really tight fit on that harness. So we really try to coach parents on that. Next. This is a tough one, but we find that most parents come in and they haven't even read the manual. Whether they haven't read the car seat manual, they haven't read the vehicle manual. Um, they've done the best that they can and they've put the car seat in, maybe reading the label. Uh, we, want, we try to encourage parents to use both. We don't want it to move more than an inch of the belt path, whether it's rear facing or forward facing. Um, we definitely teach that in all the installs that we do here and really have parents replicate that. And then parents can install whether it with a seat belt or latch, whichever works best and they'll use correctly every single time. Next. So lower anchors and tethers for children, that's what LATCH stands for. Um, it's standard in all cars after uh, September 1st of 2002. It was supposed to make it easier to correctly secure a car seat in a vehicle, but we know that that is not the case. Um, parents really struggle to still install car seats. Um, 
there's lots of rules. That's why they need to read both manuals, the vehicle manual and the car seat manual to see where the best place to fit that car seat is. But we also want them to choose the install method that they're going to use properly every time, especially if they're moving that car seat um, every day or you know a couple of times a week. Next. So booster seats, we want to make sure that we don't rush them into the booster seats. A lot of the convertible car seats now will go to 65 pounds. So the longer they're in that internal harness, the safer the children are. Next. So, but we have a high back booster and a low back booster. So the high back booster helps provide a lot of head, neck, and support, um, keeps children in the correct position. Um, it can be also helpful if your child still falls asleep and maybe their head goes to the side there. So low back boosters, our older children kind of like those a lot better because you can't see it from the outside of the car, but it still boosts them up, makes that seat belt fit correctly. So the key to that that booster seat is that the seat will go low over the hips and not across their belly. If the seat belts across their belly, they're going to have internal injuries, what doctors call seat belt syndrome. So that's what we're preventing. Next time you get in your car, look and see where that seat belt fits you. It should be low over the hips. Next. So I kind of jumped ahead of myself. So there, the if it's too small, the seat belt will go across their belly and not across their low over the hips. So more um, risk for threatening abdominal injuries. Next. So there we can see low over the hips, okay. Um, incorrect positioning, if they're too small, they can submarine and then if it will still uh, cause that um, injury to their stomach. Next one. So this is a good chart to follow to see if the child is able to sit in a booster seat. So back against the vehicle seat, the knees bent, okay? A lot of times their knees cannot bend, okay? Um, seat belt low, top of the hips, okay? Seat belt between shoulder and the neck, wearing it there. And then number five is what usually gets a lot of children. Can they stay in that position the entire trip? I know some adults that can't stay in that position the entire trip, but we need to make sure that seat belt fits them correctly. Next. So smaller children, we want to follow the best practice despite the age, keep them rear facing longer, harness longer, and in a booster longer. We're just trying to slow everything down. Make sure, sure children, um, you know, use the maximum weight and the height of each car seat. Safest place in the back seat. Okay. Children under 13 should definitely be in the back seat. That airbag was built for an adult. So if that airbag employs, it's going to hurt the child. Next. So these are just some images of, from NHTSA about where the seat belt should fit. You can see in the low back booster, low across the hips. Okay and high back booster, and then same child, 10 year old in that 65 pound five point harness, okay? So it is possible that a 10 year old can still be in a five point harness. Next. So Ohio's law, we are a proper use state. So that really means that you have to use your car seat according to the car seat manufacturers. Okay, so we recommend rear facing as long as possible. If a car seat comes in and the child is forward facing in a convertible car seat, but the car seat does say it can go forward facing at a certain age at one, unfortunately there are still some out there that say that, um, they're not using it against the law. So even though the law, um, best practice is always safer. So if, if parents argue about the, well, my car seat says it can turn around at one, it may say that, but we want to keep them rear facing as long as, as possible, okay? Booster seat law. So they cannot get out of a booster seat law. So they need to be in a car seat or a booster seat till four feet, nine inches tall or the age of eight. So I've never seen an eight-year-old that's four, nine. So um, keep them in that booster seat and maybe past the age of eight is the best practice, okay?
I'll jump in to say too about booster seats. We see a lot of really young children in boosters and I really, um, really recommend that parents keep their child in that five point harness longer. I mean, I don't know very many four year olds that can sit still. Most of them still wiggle around a lot and they're just so much safer in that five point harness. And like Ann said, it's very rare that we see an eight year old that's four feet nine. You know, in this area, we definitely have a booster seat problem, and we see a lot of kiddos coming out of um, their car seats at, you know, four or five years old and going right um, to a seatbelt. We know they don't fit. Um, they really need that booster seat to position them up higher on the seat, the vehicle seat, so that belt fits them properly. We see a lot of injuries in our ER to this. So, next slide. Traveling tips, um, state laws are different. In fact, all the states surrounding us have rear facing until two years of age laws. So it's important to remind parents to follow those laws when they travel, they're not exempt. Um, on the Governor Highway Safety Administration's website, you can actually find laws for each state. You just click on the state and it'll pull up what their laws and how it applies to each age. It's pretty cool, it's a really, really cool site. Next. Traveling tips, since we're at that time of year, it's really important that a child is in their own seat on the plane. I know the plane does not require it for two and under, um, but they are safer in a car seat every single time. Um, make sure the car seat's approved for use in a plane. It'll say on the side of it that's FAA certified. Um, they can always call one of our car seat programs and we'll talk to them about what seats work best on planes. Sometimes a smaller seat works best because those, you know, those plane seats are really tiny. Um, babies on laps are just not safe and can't possibly be comfortable for long flights for any parent um, at all. And then renting a car seat from a car rental place, believe it or not, rental places do have them, but chances are they're damaged in some way. They're old, they're not taken care of. Um, really travel with your own seat or have a seat at your, if you're not going to use it on the plane and you're checking it, it's fine, or have one at your destination when, the, when you, re, when you re, uh, arrive. Next. So we want to keep our message consistent. Okay, so rear facing um, till minimum of two years old. Okay, two to four, keep them in that five point harness. And then, you know, even beyond the age of four, that five point harness, if they're fitting in that car seat, use it to that maximum weight possible, maximum height their weight. Seven to 10 booster seat. Because like we said, usually a eight-year-old is not four feet nine. So keep them in that booster seat when they can pass that five-point test that we went over previously. Next. And then for kids that are aging out, I mean, we still see a lot of kids who are between 10 and 12 that really could still be sitting in a booster seat. They just don't sit in that belt properly. That's a really tough sell for most 10 to 12 years old. Um, but it's important that they're sitting properly. Um, I've had some luck with some, but not so much with others. Um, 13 through 15 can ride in the front seat, but the back seat's always safest. Keep in mind that the belt is designed for an adult, a five foot, a four foot nine adult, at least a minimum of. And remember that that airbag comes out at 170 to 200 miles an hour. So putting a small child in that front seat really puts them at danger. That airbag's gonna come out and it's designed to protect you or I in our chest. Um, for a small child, that airbag is in, you know, in the face. Um, so making sure that kids stay in the back seat till 13 is really important. I know when my son was learning how to drive, he's like, do I get to sit in the front seat now? And I was like, yes, <laughs> now that you're gonna drive, absolutely. Um, but I made him ride in the back much to his dismay. Um, and then making sure that kids, as they get close to that driving age, that they're always wearing that belt, no testing and driving. I always say in my virtual presentations that kids imitate you. They watch what you do from day one. If you teach them that wearing your seatbelt every time you get in the car is just what you do, that means they're going to be the next generation of buckled up riders um, or in drivers. And they're going to be driving us around someday to so teach them to be safe and really emphasize the no texting and driving, the minimizing distractions, um, et cetera. Next. Any questions? Did we have any questions in the chat box? I wasn't able to watch it as. Uh, no questions uh, that came in the chat yet, uh, but we still have a minute to answer questions. Um, there was a request to send out your good information, um, if I may do that. Yes. 
I, I, and I this was, is Dawn. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, I had a quick question. Um, so great information. I, we have an in-house uh, car seat program and a, and a um, community car seat program. So same information that we yep. share. Um, but um, I just have a quick question. Are you seeing an, um, are you seeing counterfeit car seats? We are starting to see those and we're feeling like we need to do some education around it because we are starting to see an influx of these counterfeit car seats that are coming in. Definitely. It's funny you should say that. We, we, we just had one yesterday. Um, I'm in a not only children's hospital, but we're attached to an adult hospital and a women's hospital. Um, and we had a nurse call from Rainbow and say, you know what, I've got this car seat. I just, I don't like the way it looks. Can, you know, someone pop up there and it turned out it was a counterfeit seat. Um, this year alone, we've seen, I think, seven infant car seats, counterfeit seats. Um, and we have done a lot of education with our nurses. We've taken that counter seat, uh, seat to the floors and showed them what it looks like. We really stress to them if it's missing the chest clip, chances are it's counterfeit. Maybe not 100%, but that's what they're really looking for. And then looking for that strap, like the straps that are on them on all the seats we've seen, they're the width of a, like, um, a harness strap on a high chair versus a harness strap on a car seat. So. Luckily, the nurses have really listened to our education and they call us anytime they have a question. Um, we've really done a lot of education on all the floors to keep them up to date, but I can't believe that we have to talk about counterfeit car seats of all things. Uh, and she bought it as part of a bougie travel system that was $400. Yes, so, so I, yeah, we- are still out there. Yeah, I see it when I go into the home. So it, um, uh, um, I think there's a counterfeit that looks like the Duna. Yeah. Um, and so when I go into the homes and that's just one of the th kind of the things that we'll, we end up talking about. But the families are like, you know, I saw this for $1,200 here and then I found it online for 400. So they really think that they're getting, you know, a value, yeah. but yet still getting something high priced, you know, popular. And so, um, yeah, so we, I have definitely seen it, seen an increase. I was just wondering if it was kind of a Across the board. So yeah, thank you. It's that Duna it's that is one saying, of the biggest one that's too, counterfeit. And that old saying, I was just going to say, yeah, if it sounds true, too good. good. <laughs> um, I like learning new things, but counterfeit car seats is not something that I uh, wanted to learn about. Thank you for shedding light on on that. Wow, that one more thing to worry about, right? The other thing that we yeah, didn't say is that car seats do expire, so keep that in mind too. And then real quick, can you shed some light on um, putting kids in car seats with coats on in this cold weather? Absolutely. So the way I talk to parents is, is that that puffy coat has to compress in a crash. So the puffier the coat, the more the harness has to um, um, compress. So what I usually tell a parent is try it in the car seat. Put the coat on the child, buckle, you know, zip it up, buckle them in and then take them out of that car seat without adjusting the straps and put them back in not with the, without wearing the coat and look at the difference in between the straps. It's usually pretty significant. Um, in a crash, that harness would have to compress that much just to protect the child. So, you know, a super puffy coat that could um, in a severe crash actually propel them out of the seat and out of that harness. So really talk about, you know, putting the coat on backwards once they get in the car or wrapping them in the blanket or warming the car ahead of time or choosing a coat that's not so thick. So we definitely see that and we do a lot of education around that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, please send your questions uh, to me and I will get them to the right people. Uh, sorry for the shortened question and answer period of time. Thank you so much for all of our presenters today. Thank you to Dr. Uh, Denny and, and Zainab for your good information. Um, I will be sending out the information that we didn't get to today as well. And I appreciate all of you. Uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.